Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name is Toby, and today I'm joined by Dr. Leonie Tanta, Maria Hakin, and Natasha Boyd. I'm just going to take a deep breath and introduce all three of them in one go. So, Leonie Tanta lectures at University College London on the really intriguing topic of international security and emerging technologies, which we're going to discuss not at all today. But we are instead going to discuss her side gig of designing and leading the Science for Policy elective module as part of UCL's Masters of Public Administration course. And both Maria and Natasha are former students of hers who have since gone on to equally interesting things. Maria Harkin is a political scientist and Deputy Director of International Affairs at the University of Costa Rica, where she has a special interest in science diplomacy and science advice. She's a member of the Latin American Steering Committee for INCSA, the International Network of Government Science Advice. She's also worked as a consultant for the UN and UNESCO and is a researcher for the US-funded ESCAPE project, which is evaluating science advice during the coronavirus pandemic. And I just discovered she's also a TEDx talk alumna. And Natasha Boyd was originally trained as a biologist, then completed a master's degree in science and technology, and she now works in higher education in the UK, specifically in STEM fields, that's science, technology, engineering, and maths. So, Leonie, Maria, and Natasha, welcome all three of you to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for having us, yes. So, Leonie, if I can start with you. I said we're not really going to talk about your day job, as it were, your main research interest. But I can't resist at least asking, how does a lecturer in emerging technologies end up teaching a course on science advice? That's a very good question. I ask me that quite often as well. The reason I started lecturing and teaching actually this topic of science advice is through my exposure I had to this field when I did my postdoc at STEEP, which is the same department I'm still in. And our department is really fully dedicated to the intersection of science, engineering, and technology and policy. And so I do fit into the department. It just was quite odd that I started teaching science advice because my background is actually in political science. So technically science advice hasn't been on my radar, although now that I have taught it and developed the course, I think I would say that many of us do science advice, but we have no word for it to describe it. But during my postdoc in 2017, I was asked by the department simply to develop a course. And, you know, that is quite a daunting exercise for a postdoc, but the department felt I had the skills and expertise to do so. So I started off basically, you know, working out what it is and also figuring out how my work could fit into this uh, realm. And the department teamed me up with uh, Professor Jeremy Watson, who himself is or was chief scientific advisor for the Department of Communities and Local Government in the UK, as well as Alessandro Allegra, who uh, is a PhD student uh, at the Department of Science and Technology Studies, and he's writing his PhD on the topic. So we were kind of a team of three, and they helped me to guide me through this very exciting area. And don't get me wrong, despite the support, it was quite challenging because I was the module lead. So I had to figure out how the course will be structured, what we will cover, how we will develop it and how we will deliver it. But I think actually, in retrospect, it profited hugely from the aspect that I was an outsider to the field because it allowed me to approach the topic at the same angle as uh, our students do, which is as novices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see how that's valuable. Um So you said that you think science advice is something that a lot of academics do a lot of, but they don't call it that. Uh, That's just quite a broad understanding of what science advice is. Totally. I mean, like um, when I talk about science advice, uh, I really emphasize science advice for policymaking, so for decision making. And as part of the course, we also elaborate on different forms of scientific advice that are not in the realm of policy, such as in industry. But I think it's it's important to recognize also that individuals can, and we'd cover that in the course, can give scientific advice through your involvement in consortia or uh, expert groups where many academics are sitting. So that's why I say, in retrospect, a big part of what I do on my day-to-day practice in the research that I'm actually, you know, signed up to do, there I sometimes, not always, but sometimes have the ability to give scientific advice. Yeah, fair point. Okay, so tell us a bit about the course you designed. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I really want to stress it was with the amazing input also from Alessandro that we developed this course, but also having talked to many of the colleagues that are in the department, many of which have been chief scientific advisors in the UK, in the Netherlands, and God knows where. Anyone who takes this course really can be guaranteed, despite their diverse backgrounds, because many of our students are coming from an engineering background, but some of them have a social science background, a humanities background. And the course was also open to undergraduates and postgraduates. Oh, really? So, you know, okay. yeah, so it was a really diverse mix. But I really wanted to ensure that anyone who goes away after this course has subject knowledge as well as the skills to potentially start a career in this field. And I'm delighted to say, you know, uh, Maria, who is on this call today, I mean, she had already a career in this space beforehand, but really excelled afterwards. Um, so what we structured the course with was basically in two halves. The first half was very much about like kind of giving what some people would say the boring information context and details. But again, I wanted them to have this foundation. So we focused basically from the micro to the macro level. So scientific advice in for example, the national level, and here we zoomed in onto the UK, but also here differentiating between central government, local government to parliament. We focus on regional scientific advice, focusing as it can't be more perfect talking to you from SAPEA about the European Union especially. And then also kind of the international context where we kind of zoomed in on different scientific advice models by countries the students were interested in. So they had to, for example, prepare uh, a specific uh, case study on scientific advice mechanisms in Colombia. And then also multilateral scientific advice, such as, for the example, the UN, as well as the industrial scientific advice dimensions. So, as I said, the first half was very dense, but I think it was important to give the students the full exposure to the different dimensions or levels, as I call them, of science advice. And I think the second part complemented that, that quite well because I really wanted to zoom in on the skills that students would need if they would ever go into that field. We focused on verbal skills, soft skills. Without a doubt, networks are extremely important in this realm. So, you know, we, we, we talked about like what kind of competencies, like maybe even emotional capabilities would be important and how they would gather those. But also written skills, how you would summarize information in a way that is can be useful for policy officials as well. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really proud of is also that we talked, of course, about uncertainty and malpractice. So they understood also the consequences of what happens if something goes wrong and case studies where this has happened, but also career advice. And to do this, we had a lot of external speakers who are actually working in this space or have been working in this space. We also did excursions, such as, for example, to the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, so-called POST in the UK. And we had a career coaching session at the end of the uh, course as well. That sounds like a lot. How long was this course? Well, uh, so it was three months uh, with a break. And I think we had 11 sessions, like 11 weeks in which we had lectures plus tutorials. Okay, well, gosh. Do you have any idea if there are lots of courses like this going on all around the country? Are there other sources to draw on? Or were you literally, I was going to say making it up as you went along, but that seems mean. <laughs> uh, were you like carving your own path all the way? Um, I mean, I'm biased because, you know, it, it through sweat and blood, the syllabus <laughs> and the course material came together. So uh, my answer should be taken with a pinch of salt. But I'm quite confident that we're the only department in the world that has a specific course that focuses purely on science advice because we do as part of our MPA have other you know courses on policy for science science for policy and like other elements of policy making but like a dedicated module that only focuses on science advice has not been something I have found while researching for the module because as you can envision I was a postdoc and like I was suddenly told to develop a module out of nowhere. So I was looking, you know, kind of desperately globally at like core centers that like have an expertise in this field of like, are they running a course? Is there something I could take away? But unfortunately, I did not find the course. And equally, I did not find the textbook. I would say only through the talking to people that are, you know, and having these experts that are coming to the session despite the fact I briefed them very carefully that the structure would be maintained and ideas that I have, you know, gathered from reading the literature, I felt that were important to cover would be addressed by these external speakers. I feel like what we have 
developed here is definitely unique. And I think it's filling an important gap as especially the recent COVID crisis has shown. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, so so this predates the pandemic, right? What year was this when you were first planning it all? So I was told 2017 that I had to develop the course and it ran, it started in January 2018. Yeah. I wonder a bit whether this might have changed now or maybe is changing, you know, given the prominence of science advice since 2020, maybe there's more demand from students and more courses might be springing up. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be curious to see if, uh, if even after this podcast, you know, kind of Roger Pilk and like James Wilson immediately will run and develop a course and put a proposal in for, for the university. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, Roger, if you're listening, you heard it here first. Make sure you put the podcast <laughs> in your reading list, please. But, uh, I do think it it's remains still a very niche topic, I would say. So even though it has become so publicly relevant and discussed but i think we haven't asked ourselves the question you know have all chief scientific advisors and and related bodies ever become a training in this field and most likely they haven't they have done other courses that relate to it in in science and technology studies or you know just gone to an engineering course you know um but without a doubt uh, i see a need for more of these courses and i'm sure there will be more in the future Sure. In which case, this then seems like the perfect moment to turn to Maria and Natasha. So both of you obviously have interesting expertise in your own right, which I'm sure we will dip into. But as I mentioned at the start, what connects you to this conversation specifically is that you were students on this course. So I'm really interested to know like, how it seemed from your perspective. What caught your eye about it and, and why did you decide to study it? So as a political scientist, uh, my previous work experience uh, before enrolling in, in this master was related to research about democracies in Latin America. So, so back then, uh, I focused all my attention to understand the decision-making process of governments in Latin America. What evidence do they use? What resources do they have to make decisions? And, and above all, what kind of attention were they given to the research and to the scientific community, which I was part of at, at that time. I was part of a research center that was constantly providing evidence uh, about the state of the democracy in the region to local authorities. So uh, back then I decided to, to, to study a master abroad and, and, and I was looking for the right master. And I can say without a doubt that is the description of this science advice model in the website was the reason why I chose uh, this UCL master in at a steep uh, department and, and flew 80,000 miles from my home country to the UK to, to learn more about science advice. I was looking um, in particular to learn more about that intersection of engineering uh, with public policy to improve the decision making in Latin America uh, upon my return. Good stuff, thanks. For the benefit of listeners, that was Maria you just heard. And uh, Natasha, do you want to add anything? I, I, I don't have such a valiant um, um, traveling journey as, as you might be able to tell from my accent. I'm originally from Manchester. So with my background was in, was in biological sciences and what caught my interest with then doing a master's in science policy, um, generally science and technology studies, but I focused on science policy was what you were describing, Maria, how do we go from that research, that knowledge building that I saw in in my background um, in environmental science and climate change science, how do we go from that to policy and specifically what's going on there? Because at least from a kind of naive perspective, it didn't seem that the what the scientists would say was directly going into policy. And obviously, my master's showed me the many reasons why that's the case. But I then really wanted to hone in on, on, on the module Leone runs because there's so many um, theories around science policy within science and technology studies. And, you know, they're all wonderful and, and really kind of conceptual. But I wanted to kind of see the mechanics. I wanted to see how does this work? Right. And did it pay off? I mean, I'm not asking you to review the module right now, but was there anything in particular that you found surprising or that stuck with you from what you studied? Obviously, the kind of learning about frameworks and how um, science advice systems work at different levels was really interesting. But what was 
something that I really took away and I have kind of ran with in my career since has been those soft skills and how much in practice this is relying on negotiations and kind of understanding the landscapes and positioning your research and yourself and, you know, the research of your institution or your team within the right context to then have impact. Maybe one one surprise that I had is that I was entering an engineering faculty. And I could easily identify the intersection with political sciences and with social sciences. Back home, I, I was told, are you crazy? What is a political scientist doing in an engineering faculty? And, and I really appreciated the fact that this specific model and program helped me to understand that intersection and, and in particular to, to now being able to design a, a research agenda about that specific intersection, political sciences, and science advice to government, right? So to, to dig more about the political culture of a country. Uh, so I, I could identify that huge opportunity uh, for a future research agenda for, for countries like mine, uh, like Costa Rica, lower and middle income countries uh, that also need that research agenda. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. So just to be sure I understand what you're saying, uh, I mean, I can see for sure the overlap between political science and science advice and how the two interact but when people were saying you're crazy why are you going to an engineering faculty what was your reply to them i mean do you also see connections with engineering i definitely see connections within engineering the 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 thing is that maybe uh, you come from disciplines that may be more traditional and that they are not used to see the interdisciplinary uh, value of uh, building bridges with other faculties, with other areas of knowledge. So that's why uh, I, I was stubborn on, on embarking in this journey across the ocean, literally, but also in, in, in embarking in a journey into different uh, knowledge areas like uh, hard sciences, engineering, and, 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 and that was extremely helpful to the work that I am currently doing at the moment. Yeah, and Leonie, uh, you hinted at uh, a few challenges, many of which seem to come from this being the first course ever designed about science <laughs> advice. But uh, in terms of the actual like course material and content, what challenges did you face there? I, I, I mean, the biggest, biggest obstacle was the fact that there is a lack of literature in the field. So, you know, I came as an outsider to this field. So what I did is what I was like a vacuum, like a hoover. I, I tried to get every piece of publication on scientific advice on my uh, reading list. And I even accumulated for the students, like literally everything I have found as an appendix to the syllabus. Uh, and I, I religiously update the syllabus, you know, whenever I see a new publication. But I felt like despite the fact, you know, I have this long appendix, there's still a lack of literature that A, is diverse and shows diverse perspectives but also B is evidence-based and is not just an opinion piece or a descriptive outline of what happens. So as you can hear from the two descriptions of Maria and Natasha, many of our students come specifically to our university, to our department, because they want practical education. You know, they're not here, unfortunately, sometimes unfortunately, to, to just discuss. They want something very practical advice of how am I going to implement this? And I personally think, and the scientific advice field would agree with that, you can only tell students what to do if you have evidence to tell them what works, you know. And I think that is a dilemma in the scientific advice field in that we don't really have a lot of studies on what works and what doesn't work. And equally, uh, that is associated with the fact that there's only a handful of people that publish um, in a specific area. And, and so that really was a challenge. And I'm, I'm sure frustrated also a lot of students to this very day. Right, yeah. One of the, the things that could be interesting to add to what Leonie just mentioned is that for the last month, I have been working with two Latin American colleagues, Matias Acosta and Matias Nestore, in, in researching about legislative science advice. And, and we were interested to, in understanding two things. First, what was the state of the art in that topic, right? And second, who has research about this? So one of the first steps, that we undertook was uh, doing like a legislative science advice uh, literature inventory 
in order to understand who was publishing and, and, and about what. And what we found out is that one, and this is not surprising at all, is that uh, this, this literature is mainly done in the EU and for the EU. And that second bit is, is very important because we are generating knowledge about a particular region of the world and, and about a particular political cultural and political systems, which may not be the norm elsewhere, right? We also identify uh, interesting champions in the topic uh, within the EU, like the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, and of course, outside the EU, like the US, Canada, and New Zealand. But we were extremely surprised by the lack of uh, diversity in other regions. And and what, what was interesting also is that we found at least some unconventional pieces, like uh, one from, from Latin America, in particular from Chile, and from Africa in Botswana. However, it is not enough in order to include that in a, in a course, in a reference list, and, and, and to fill that gap that Leonie was just referring about some minutes ago. Yeah, so, so what is the issue here? Is it that the scholarship doesn't exist in other places, so it's just like an underdeveloped field in general, or does it exist but somehow not make it into our field of vision? I think both, to be honest. I think that even within the SDS literature, even within countries that have a lot of scientific output and that do generally explore kind of science and society issues, there's still not as much literature, specifically not as much practical literature as the only says about what works and where. But I think that it's also the fact that there isn't any literature about countries that aren't generally in the Western world. I think the the centres where this is being explored academically are generally based in the Western world and they focus on their own countries. And, and if I could add to that, in addition to the literature, I really, really want to stress science advice as a whole has a diversity issue. This is something I explored with a colleague of mine, Dr. Jenny McArthur. We wrote a blog post, which we co-wrote with our students to reflect on our you know, teaching experience and also with the students to explore kind of the limitations that are there, not just in the scholarly literature, but as the practical field in itself, because, you know, Unfortunately, science advice, just like many other fields, often favors the well-networked and influential people. So that means knowledge, expertise and power, which is so essential for evidence or science and, and academia, you know, that is conglomerated in certain places and institutions. And if I may say, even when you look at all the people you have interviewed for this podcast, you know, that's a certain type of group of people. And the representation of other knowledge forms, other voices that still feed into the scientific advice discourse are not necessarily heard. So it's not just about the readings as such, which I still, you know, from an academic perspective and someone who had to develop a reading list, that was my main concern. But it goes beyond that. It goes towards case studies that we can use that are publicly discussed, external speakers that I could invite that weren't white, super educated and privileged English-speaking males. I, and so, you know, I fully acknowledge that with the course, and, and I strongly encourage the students to push back on that, but I did had to a certain extent to reproduce a particular Western canon of scientific advice in the sense that, you know, the, the course subject topics that we covered were often English-speaking, the, the writings were from the global north, and they had to read articles from a, as I would say, rather privileged elite of people. But I acknowledge that and I tried to counteract it by discussing with the students, for example, about them digging deeper into their countries of interest, for example, to dig out information that like, they can share with the rest of the cohort. And thankfully, the cohort was always exceptionally diverse. Uh, we had a year where there was no duplication of nationalities, which was absolutely mad. And so I think once we realize, okay, who is talking and who is practicing in this field, we see the same language, the same habitus, the same education, and probably also the same disciplinary background being replicated. Because we're perpetuating this nearly in the scientific advice module, I thought it was important to, you know, bring this to the fore, critique it internally, even though I was like struck by the fact that there's nothing I could tell students to do about this as of now, other than 
join the field and make it different. Because scientific advice is not just about translation and synthesis or knowledge brokerage, but sadly, it's also about gatekeeping of what evidence is being acknowledged and used. And I think that's why it's A, this module is so important, but B, the discussion about diversity and who has a say in this field is so essential. And I'm so, so happy that the students are joining me today here, although I should say they're no longer students. They are absolutely at the forefront of this field. And and that's what is important, that they have gone into this area and hopefully help to diversify it. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you've already had that kind of effect. I think this is a really important topic. And um, well, as regards to your observation about this podcast, I mean, I think you're right. And it's one of the reasons I was so keen to invite you to have exactly this kind of conversation. So let's try, to, well, I'd like to first kind of collect together all the various issues that you just mentioned, then we can perhaps drill down on some of them. So first of all, when you say the diversity problem, you mentioned a few different uh, dimensions of diversity, and I'd like to, to, to try and get them all on the table. So we're talking about language and geographical origin, but you also mentioned uh, gender and class and educational background. Are these the kinds of things you're talking about when you talk about diversity or, or lack of diversity in science advice? Yeah, I mean, basically, we're reproducing a certain type of social group that has gone to certain universities. So the really big crux is, and I see this with an international leading university like UCL, we have all these fantastic people coming to the UK, and it's so amazing to have them here. But like experts often don't stay in a country once they reach a certain kind of like uh, expertise level. Um, You know, academics are very mobile or want to be very mobile. And if there's better funding grants in the UK, you know, they, they move to the UK. And so I think like we had also addressed this dimension of even if you try your best to keep the expertise in a country like that is something that could become a problem for for scientific advice in a country. So, yeah, any social category you can think of is if you look at the literature, if you look at the people who are scientific advisors who are involved in this field, not represented sex, gender, class, race, but also seniority level, I think. You know, that's a really important one. And that is something I certainly have experienced firsthand starting as a postdoc in this area. Maybe a fun fact that I could add to that, uh, to what Leoni just mentioned, is that the first scientific advisor in the United States was not a scientist. And and now I am referring to the, the importance of diversity in academic background. Actually, the first U.S. scientific advisor, uh, his academic training was in management and administration, and he didn't have a uh, had a doctorate. So that that was a very important fun fact that I discovered and, and, and that I wanted to highlight in this conversation because even in the very big uh, science advice scenarios, like could be the one in the United States, diversity was important uh, at every level or, 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 or diversity should have been important at, at, at every level. That, that's why it is, it is very important to acknowledge that fact and to continuously remind the importance of, of diversity in conversations, in, in institutional structures, and so on. Build on that, what I'm kind of taking both from the course and from this conversation is that there's really two types of diversity we're talking about here. And one is the kind of need for what SDS would call epistemic plurality in science advice. So we're talking about you know, getting multiple different forms of knowledge around the decision-making table and how that's not really happening, both in terms of discipline and also in terms of subject matter within a, a discipline. And I think that the other thing, you know, as they only much more eloquently put it, is that the actual people doing the science advice, the actual people being called upon to be scientific advisors, who are writing the reports, who are publishing the papers, both in terms of the papers about science advice from an academic perspective, as well as the people publishing the science that then gets fed into policy, are from a very specific dominant social group, which, as the only said, tends to be white um, from the Northern Hemisphere, from, you know, European ethnicities and male. And that that can create a problem in generating good and effective science advice. Hmm. I wonder whether you think, well, hmm, let me start again. I'm not going to ask if you think these different dimensions are all equally 
important. But but do you think they're all important in the same way? This gets a bit into the question of, I suppose, why diversity is important anyway. So feel free to comment on that too. It seems to me that the two categories you just mentioned are, are kind of a bit different in kind. So on the one hand, you've got what we might call the universal dimensions of diversity that we're concerned about across society, like gender and class and age and ethnicity and some others. And then on the other side, you've got things like disciplinary diversity, maybe also, you know, career seniority, as Leonie mentioned, which seem also important, but maybe in different ways. Um, what, what do you think? No, like, I, I, th- I think you've hit the nail on the head that both types of diversity, as we've kind of put into two categories, are really important, but they're important for really different reasons. So um, as far as I would see it, the need for this diversity of subject in the literature is you know, needed to better understand what works and where it works and how we can improve and how we can have that learning. You know, Western science policy systems like we have in the UK, like they have in the Netherlands, are by no means perfect, but they're not going to encounter some of the same problems that other science advice systems might need, such as countries that have to consider involving indigenous communities in decision making, dealing with a more limited research capacity due to fewer university institutions or or limited funds to sustain the science policy process it goes. And so papers that are only coming out of the same institutions about the same countries and the same regions are not going to provide true insight to those areas. And similarly, by focusing on those areas, countries like the UK um, and other European countries aren't able to learn from the experiences of other countries. But then, you know, the other side of the diversity, this kind of diversity in the stakeholders that we see in the the players, if you like, in the science advice and the science policy process in practice. I think that type of diversity is important because if we have a diversity of people around the table, diversity of people feeding into the decisions, we're more likely to get to policy and to get to science that benefits a wider range of people, as well as obviously the moral imperative of not excluding proportions of our society and proportions of people. And, you know, both science and policy is, um, in most countries, taxpayer funded. And so there's a strong argument there as well for this this second kind of diversity that the science policy that we're producing should be representing and serving, you know, the broadest range of publics that it can. And can I briefly just because you you say that these are two different types of diversity, you talk about race, gender, language, etc. And then there's the other side of disciplinary background and seniority. I actually think they're inherently interconnected. If you think about like gender, race, language, that's likely impact into what discipline you go to, whether you study any STEM subject. But also, unfortunately, and as an early career researcher myself, I know that now very much, you know, it also impacts on your promotion ability, you know, whether or not you're going to become a professor, which is a title that is so important in this field on whether you become invited to certain kind of committees, uh, 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 fora, etc. So I uh, think, hang on, hang on, sorry. Uh, what affects your promotability? You mean your discipline? Well, I mean, the discipline is one aspect, for example, that affects my funding ability, which then can negatively affect my promotion ability. So, you know, I'm not a humanities scholar, but even like the social science funding pots have drastically been cut. And so if you compare like me towards a computer science professor or, or lecturer, you know, we have different opportunities to attract even industrial funding, which, you know, is not the same uh, available to to certain disciplines. So so I think they are interconnected. While I understand that you see that them at different levels or at different parts of this puzzle, I do think diversity and the impact all of these have together need to be looked at as an interconnected net, so to say. Also, if if I can refer back to our model uh, uh, back in 2018, um, one of the the final essay question uh, of the model was if the UK chief scientific advisor model could be applied to every country. And at first, 
I must admit that we, we thought it was a tricky question, but uh, the reality is, is that it helped us analyzing and reflecting and criticizing why uh, it does not necessarily apply to every country. Every science advice system represents a particular political culture and political system of every country, right? So uh, it will also uh, depend on, on a specific um, elements on, on, of that culture that cannot be copied and pasted uh, elsewhere. So, for example, uh, cabinet turnover, which was a subject that I studied for many years before enrolling in the master, uh, is not the same one in Costa Rica that in the UK. So that particular element is not a small at all. Actually, it's huge to understand why a CSA model could not fit like identically in, 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 in Latin America. Or, for example, uh, the rates of approval of a government also are very important, uh, are key to understand why a CSA model could be applied to a particular country and not necessarily elsewhere. So I, I wanted to, just to add on that question because having to answer that types of questions in a very early stage of our, our career related to science advice was essential to understand that not necessarily a very strong model applied in a particular country could uh, be copied and pasted elsewhere uh, without any particular uh, changes or, or reflections. And, and, and that us as a researchers, as practitioners in, sci in the science advice world would need to like select particular elements that work well there, but that needed to be adjusted to our particular context and realities back home. Yeah, so this is interesting uh, to me because I, um, there's a lot of interest and, and concern at the moment, especially at European level, about the importance of or, or the need to um, kind of internationalize or localize science advice. So, so I mean, to take advice that was generated in one place on one level, like, say, the European Commission scientific advice mechanism, and kind of pass it along to individual member states so they can also benefit from the same product, you know, because we all face similar problems and science is universal and we may as well be efficient and blah, blah. And then how come this doesn't happen right now? Well, because we're not yet well enough connected. We're not efficient enough. So we don't have the networks or whatever. So let's work on building those. But what you've just said is kind of an interesting counterpoint to that, suggesting you can't simply copy and paste things for the reasons you've just said. And I guess that also applies to another area of interest for us at EU level, because you can say the same about the design of the advice mechanisms themselves. What works well for one country might work because it interfaces well with that country's culture and political setup and institutions and so on. And it might simply not connect well at all with another country. I mean, you, you really touch on the crux of this course, you know, like, uh, because no, I, I, so one of the challenges was I outlined these different levels, as I called them, because I wanted to show the diversity of the of these systems. And I would say there's a part of the academic, you know, scholarly discipline around science advice that argues, let's just replicate the Westminster model. It works for the UK, New Zealand, Canada, whatnot. It must work everywhere. But that's not the case. And I personally think, and the students can tell you if they see it differently, but one way that I showed that this doesn't work is on the example of the European Union, because the European Union started off with a chief scientific advisory model, you know, and they realized that's not working. We have so many member states, so much diversity, that's, that's not going to fly. And they decided to instead have a high level group and the, uh, the scientific advice mechanism. And I think that is far more reflective of the culture and outlook of the European Union than it is, for example, for the Westminster model in the UK, where it's okay to have one or two men standing at the front of something and talking to you what to do. You know, like, I think that is really, personally, I think that was really the beauty. And I hope that really came across to the students that they saw actually, you know, what they think it works here will not work there. And that's why I also asked them to dig deep into the countries of their interest or where they are from to see, is that reflective of the political system as well? And I have to say, 
the, the really challenging part of this course was I always had to start off with the political system first and then dig into the scientific advice mechanisms because that was the only way you could see why it ended up to be operating in a certain way. So, yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I really, yeah, like for me, this is the core message I hope to have translated in this course that like, there, yes, there are certain things that work in certain contexts, but don't be fooled by them working there that they will be working otherwise. And don't be fooled that there's only one right way to do things. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, this ties into what I'm sure many of your guests will have discussed before, which is that the science policy process is not a linear, value-free, smooth system where we take science <laughs> and we make policy. You know, there are all That's these... That's come up once or twice, yeah. Maybe once or twice. And, you know, there are all these 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 messy factors. And, you know, the that is going to change based on the culture of different spaces, based on, you know the historical context of different spaces, the capacity within those spaces. And so there is not going to be one method that is going to work everywhere. And what is helpful or would be helpful with the literature is not to say, here's a model and we think it's the best. It's to say, here's something that was tried in this space for this issue. This is what worked. This is what doesn't. And, you know, is there any, you know, and then it's open to the literature and then people in different spaces can see what they can take from that and assess what you know they can't take from that in their in their space in their area and and i think that also touches upon diversity of systems but also diversity of the people that represent these systems and why i we are honing into this diversity element so much is because i feel as of now many of these scientific advisory models even if they are diverse, are not accounting for the different needs and experiences, access requirements and expectations of people. Just to give a bit of context to this, I'm teaching also a course called Gender and Technology, where we look at like how gendered assumption are manifesting themselves in technology, but also then how technology you know, helps replicate certain gender stereotypes. And our department is in an engineering faculty. So it's really important that like the people that in the future design certain systems are not building certain assumption into the design of these systems. But also, and I really want to stress this, that neither policy officials are building assumptions into the policies that define certain things in the future. And we, we have this really cool exercise called how to change the world. And we bring all the engineering departments together into a group. And like we have all the thousands of students to basically work together on specific real world challenges. And to give you an example of why diversity is needed, when we start the challenge, and I was in the past responsible for the energy challenge uh, to, to solve a problem in a refugee camp in BDBD in Uganda, the students very quickly come to assumptions about what a refugee would need or what a refugee camp would look like. And our university students are, you know, coming from diverse backgrounds, but still probably none had any experience ever been a refugee. Many are also, you know, male and, and come from very privileged backgrounds. So they started off with their life experience and the things that they've heard to then design engineering solutions or policy solutions as for that matter. But I think it was important to bring different people and stakeholders into the mix. So they had to speak to stakeholders, for example, charities that are locally working in this space to actually hear first by someone who is there, what it's like to be there and what really the problem is. And only that they are able to really design technical engineering systems that are actually addressing the need of the people. And I think the same applies to the scientific advisory model. If we don't have people in a room that have first on experience about the effect of a certain decision, you know, you will assume what will happen and how it will manifest itself in the real world. And I think that's dangerous. And that's why we need to have, you know, multiple people on the table, multiple disciplines, multiple genders, multiple people from different like backgrounds, experiences, because then they can intervene and say, actually, you assume this, but as it turns out, this will have not the consequence there. And I think that's really the crux and that's the beauty of diversity. And that's why I'm so adamant that it is needed. Right. And just to emphasize again, we're not just talking about science advice scholarship. We're talking about diversity among actual practitioners. 
Absolutely. It's, it's, it, I mean, the, the challenge is equally as hard. I mean, the scholarship is just a reflection of like, you know, the, the elitism that is in academia and the scholarly realm. But equally, you know, uh, practitioners, who has the chance to sit on a table and who makes it to the top to actually influence decisions that I think the, the challenges are equally in, as hard and the diversity levels are equally as dire. Okay, cool. Thank you. So you've made some very clear arguments for the importance of diversity. And um, Natasha, I think it was you who mentioned a little while back that all being on top of the moral importance of diversity anyway, as a basic kind of principle of being fair to people and equalizing opportunities and redressing untoward imbalances as much as we can. So, so, so there's no way I can claim to speak on behalf of you know the science advice community at large, much less science advice scholars. But I, I'm just reflecting really on the kinds of conversations I've had on this podcast and elsewhere. And it seems to me that in contemporary thinking about science advice, some parts of what you've said are absolutely well recognized and acknowledged. And the clearest one to me is the discipline issue. I think there is very wide recognition. And actually, I can't think of any time I've heard the opposite argued um, that science advice absolutely must draw on as broad a range of disciplines as well as there are. Um, And whether or not we've reached optimum discipline recognition yet, I mean, clearly we've not, but there's very clear momentum in that direction. The issue is broadly recognized. And I think the understanding there and the reason for that is that by adding more disciplines, we can see that you gain a lot, as you've articulated, and you lose basically nothing because you add more perspectives and more ways of thinking and more domains of knowledge. And I think I'd probably also say a little more hesitantly, perhaps, that I think it's also starting to be recognized about age and seniority. So, for example, I know we in Sapea as part of the EU's like formal science advice setup, we're about to add Europe's young academies to our structure. And we've always included early career researchers in our working groups. And, you know, we're not the only ones. But then the other areas, I think, uh, I mean, other than discipline and seniority, are much less mentioned in my experience. And I think, again, that might be because they, in a way, seem like a different kind of thing. And you can imagine the argument being made that there is the moral justification for diversity, sure, but that concern has to be balanced kind of against other concerns which can sometimes be in tension with it. So to put it more crudely than I've ever heard it actually put, the argument might go, a bit of elitism at the top of science is what we want because we want, uh, because scientific facts are facts and we want excellence. We want the best people no matter who they are. So while we don't, seek to discriminate on diversity criteria, we should basically just disregard them. We should set aside every criterion except excellence. And if you're the top expert and you know what you're talking about, then you should be at the table and and nobody else should be, right? And that might not be at the end of the day a good reason to keep out diverse views because it might not outweigh the moral reason to want diversity, but it is at least a competing factor you might want to recognize when you decide how to respond to a lack of diversity. What do you think? Um, so I, I, I think that there's a few things to say there. Um, the first one would be that, um, I mean, there has been some research done uh, more in a, in a corporate setting that, you know, having a diverse workforce does lead to better decision making. It does lead to um, better outcomes. And albeit that that's in a corporate context, um, McKinsey, the consultancy, wrote a paper about this. It's called um, Diversity Wins, um, if people want to go away and read it. And they found that exactly that. When people were diverse um, and made decision, those decisions were more likely to be successful. In the case they were looking at that, it was obviously profit-based. But it's quite clear that we can apply the same principles to um, science, which, you know, as much as we would like to think of is kind of clever people thinking clever ideas, that is also a collaborative process. And so having diversity in that collaborative process can only lead to better outcomes. I think the other kind of rebuttal to statements that I know you're not making, but that people might make similar to that is, well, who gets to decide what scientific excellence is? Because I don't think on a personal level, I wouldn't say a science that's done 
by an exclusive group of people is excellent. If we're talking about scientific excellence be kind of high impact papers, like what 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 metrics are we using here? Um, and I don't want to get into a kind of what is science debate because that's not the space for it here. But you know, when we think about scientific excellence, we act like that's one thing, but no one has made it clear who gets to decide that. I I, I cannot you know like everything Natasha just said because. Toby, you just said, they gave the example, what is if there's the best professor, you know? First of all, we assume probably it's a he. So on what basis have we assessed this? As Natasha said, is it uh, based on their publication output, on their funding, that them being at a prestigious university, how often they're in the media, perhaps they're smarter, but then smart is also a very weird uh, uh, concept. Is it based on their IQ level or their social intelligence? Or is it simply because this professor is the loudest? And that's why this statement, which I'm sure you replicated because that's what one hears when one talks about diversity, is so flawed. Because it assumes that diversity and excellence are mutually exclusive, which they are not. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, to be clear, the, the view I was putting across wasn't suggesting they're mutually exclusive, only that they can sometimes be in tension. Also, I think I should be clear, I wasn't like quoting anyone there. I've not heard that position argued in that way. I, I kind of synthesized it so that you... And, and you, yeah, I okay. didn't assume that, but uh, out of own personal experience, I also know that these are statements people would say when they are not on the record. The best example I can give is gender quotas. People absolutely despise them. But if we are in a scientific advice discourse, we need to look at the evidence. And the evidence shows that gender quotas have positive effects. They have positive effects on, for example, political spheres with, with regards to political uh, representation of women. They have shown to fill the gap in girls' aspiration to advance in education, such as STEM, but also having careers in, in politics. And most importantly, also, they have secondary effects, such as where women were better represented, led to better outcomes, for example, for climate policy interventions. And they were more effective as a consequence of that. So they always have shown to be beneficial in the long run for society as a whole. So I really think, you know, the scientific advice field needs to ask itself the same question. Who are the people that are claimed to be the best? And on what metrics are we assessing that? And have we over the years not managed to exclude people because they didn't fulfill the metrics that the same people that are in the forefront of this field have created? So I think the, there, there is a, a word that is key in this, in this discussion and in this reflection, and it is the, the word resistance. And, and when I think about uh, diversity in science advice to governments, my initial judgment was that maybe uh, decision makers were not considering all the evidence that was put out there by the scientific community. That was my initial thought. But what I learned during my UK experience is that that lack of diversity is also a responsibility of the scientific community and that we need that more scientific uh, areas go out into the world and speak about their evidence and also um, wanting them to be involved in a scientific advice process, right? So what I discover is that there are many maybe islands of knowledge and that lack of bridges between disciplines is actually counterproductive to the scientific advice process, right? Actually, the opposite uh, situation or reality uh, would actually enrich the scientific uh, production. So basically, uh, my message would be that that lack of diversity could also be worked or treated or, or attended with the scientific community also being open and also being less resistant to being involved in uh decision-making processes in, in, in different levels in, in countries. So despite the resistance, how much awareness do you think there is of this problem? I personally assume and I hope that there is awareness, but I personally do not see that much actions that follow on from this discussion. I also think that there's a certain level of resistance as well, just like the statement you shared with us earlier. I think the same statement probably is lingering around in certain communities as well. 
So I think, uh, you know, it is really important that we try to show with evidence that this perception is not worthwhile to hold and that hopefully will change the assumptions that uh, people hold potentially against the argument for more diversity in the field. Mm, yeah. Is this a specific problem about science advice? I mean, I can see how it has particularly like heavy implications in science advice because of the high stakes and because it's important for society. But do you think it's a, a, like a specific case of a more general problem? I think there's a few things going on. I mean, like we know these problems exist within broader society and they're certainly not specific to science advice. Um, but I do think, you know, science advice comes under science policy and that science policy is uh, the confluence of academia, science and policy. And all of those areas have a particularly bad diversity issue. That can go so far to explain why we see this lack of diversity, but it certainly doesn't excuse it, particularly because an area so grounded in evidence or that claims to be so grounded in evidence should really have the capacity to be self-reflective and make change where change will be beneficial. So not to be too gloomy for the whole conversation, do you know of examples where this has been addressed in a positive way? Certainly, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think the European Union had some form of uh, reflection that like certain models don't work and also that we need a bit more diversity, at least like when it comes to disciplinary backgrounds. So we do have, you know, uh, the the high level uh, group of scientific advisors that are set together by, you know, material scientists, biologists, historian, geographers. They're still all, I would say, very esteemed people without a doubt. And probably that's also wanted and needed. But behind it is there's a very diverse like structure uh, around what is feeding advice into these, uh, you know, structures beyond just seven people. I also would say, despite the fact I haven't heard much about it since 2016, but the United Nations has, uh, you know, uh, set up the General Scientific Advisory Board that was also set together by different people, different backgrounds and communities. Um, that certainly for me was an example that I share in the course as like an attempt to diversify the scene. But also I think a good example, at least in the UK, is uh, post uh, by having established a social science section, which brings in this diversity of perspectives that up to this point was very much focused on like kind of health engineering um, uh, sciences. And so I think that opens up opportunities for diverse, voice, diverse voices to be heard in the parliamentary scientific advice mechanism. Mm -hmm. So POST is the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology in the UK. Yeah. So the obvious final question, then, what needs to change? I, I want to start first with, with suggestions for the discipline, um, because I think uh, that is something that like is close to my heart. And it's also something that like, you know, with the module design, I have encountered as a problem. And uh, I mentioned earlier the blog post that Dr. Jenny McArthur and I have written as a consequence of our teaching. We shared with the community three steps that we hope the field as such would take to improve the situation. And one of them is to reflect on the course syllabi, what type of of groups and communities, we're giving a voice and uh, are sharing information with students. And we, for example, recommend to use gender balanced assessment tools, but also to go to, uh, uh, you know, liberating the curriculum, you know, sessions that many universities have set up to basically diversify the type of research students are exposed to. The second point we uh, are emphasizing is to advance interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary scholarship by bringing together different disciplines. And that really is really, I think, important in the context of our department, our university, where, you know, the course is open to any discipline. So, you know, I think it's unique to have an engineer sit to next to a, a biologist and a biologist sitting next to a political scientist, and then them also being some from an undergraduate and others from a postgraduate degree. And I think that is really important as well to bring together an eclectic group, uh, uh, not just in the university context, but beyond. And last but not least, to also identify and challenge the way that science advice depends, but also perpetuates these elitist power structures that we have been banging on for the last hour. 
And I think that's really important to basically think about pedagogical tools to not like exclude certain groups and communities. And I think um, it's important that we equip uh, students to critique the syllabus themselves and to push back on certain assumptions. And also, we, we shall not forget the times that we are currently living in. We are living throughout a pandemic, or at least the start of the end of a pandemic. And um, COVID-19 um, will have a long-lasting effect on, on, on the status and on, and on the relevance of scientific advice in policymaking. And, and we have reached a point of no excuse for studying sciences. This is, this is the first time ever in postmodern times that all countries are struggling with the same problem. So actually, it is the best time to compare who has done it better or worse and why and what can we improve in the future. And, and likewise, it, it, is, it is a good time to know about science. We, we now know who is researching what kind of fields. It is the, the, the research on research, right? Who are these researchers? This is why I think um, projects like the SCAPE project uh, funded by the, National, the U.S. National Science Foundations are, are very important because they are at least trying to uh, approximate uh, what is happening in 16 case studies around the globe that previously had little to none literature evidence on science advice systems or mechanisms. So I think the pandemic, it is an ideal time to produce evidence about science advice, but also to make decisions on how to improve the science advice systems around the globe and take the best evidence that is out there to improve those decision-making processes. Yeah, I mean, beautifully, I don't have much to add other than science advice is in the spotlight now. And with that comes a level of scrutiny and a real need to optimize and that's everywhere and we have this wonder as you know as maria said we have this wonderful case study and this wonderful point of comparison as well as seeing where maybe a lack of diversity of input into decision making has led to certain countries becoming unstuck from not learning from other countries or even you know on a more micro level not um, communicating in a way that reached a diverse number of communities that tackled misinformation in an effective way and I think that that along with all the great initiatives we are seeing in universities and in society more broadly is going to lead to improvements but not fast enough. Hmm. And there, I think we will have to leave it. This has been a, a really invigorating discussion and I think very welcome indeed. I hope it's the first of many such conversations on these kinds of topics. So thank you all so much, Dr. Leonie Tenser, Maria Hakeen and Natasha Boyd for your insights. It's been a delight. Thank you, uh, Toby, Leonie, Natasha for, for this and greetings from San Jose, Costa Rica. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. <laughs> <laughs> The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learning societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko. So I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.